Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to greet all of you here. And I'm very happy that you are inspired by the questions regarding Moskva River. I'm also very grateful to Stroka for hosting tonight's event here. I would like to ask you a question that is not as popular as Nastya's question, but who of you ever swam in Moskva River? took a bathe, took a swim in Moskva River. Who of you did this? Outside of city, mostly outside of city, exactly. This is an important question. At the end of the lecture, we shall return to that question. A few words of background. I began working on Moskva River in 2014 as an architect of the Meganom Architecture Bureau. That's when we won the competition to do urban improvement of embankments of river. And ever since then, for five years, I'm working on the river. River is my main domain of work. The concept that won the project had one significant idea. That was the idea of the port of the future, this new type of public space, this public space like San Marco in Venice, but in Moscow for some reason, and maybe not actually in Moscow, but it might be spread around the entire peripheral regions of the city, and it could be happening even in the a uh, neighborhood of Kapotnya at the outskirts of the city. This idea is important for city. Moskva River is important because it's about decentralization of this huge Moscow city. It's about the new non-linear center. So these ports of the river might be attraction points, gravity points around the entire river, down the entire river, so that people would be enjoying the river regardless of where they live, in the center or at the outskirts of the city. And this urban design concept, the idea of the port is still to be fulfilled. And let me briefly tell you about what we have been doing for those five years since 2014. So it all began as an urban design project, as an, as an urban design contest, and then we did clarifications, detailed designs, lots of works regarding some just more detailed design of the project. And by 2017, we have finalized the range of project seminars with the residents of Moscow. And during those project seminars, we have found out what is the nature of relationship between those people who live on the river and the river. And it's their own river. That's their own embankments. And that was fascinating because we have realized that, as a matter of fact, this project project cannot be implemented top down. River is a public good, a piece of public good. And this public good, it demands the inclusion of people who care, who live alongside the river. So we clearly realize that we need actively involved residents into the project and into the implementation of the project. And ever since then, we began doing working on those on building those communities of friends of Moscow River in 2019. Last September, that was, the Triennale of Milan invited us so that we, as the friends of the Moscow River, arrange an uh, exhibition. The main theme of the Triennale in Milan was broken nature, where we discussed different issues of how to survive in the future. In this period of Anthropocene, and um, our exposition that we presented there, the exhibits that we presented there, in many ways were kind of a breaking point for us, because when we were uh, preparing the exhibits, we realized that we're actually changing our look at the river, the optics through which we're looking at the river. No longer was the river the, uh, an object for transformation, an object to be transformed. Now, River is a fully righteous subject in this interaction. 
By the way, this is the way our exhibition looked, and we got one of the prizes as one of the best pavilions at the Triennale in uh, Milan. Third out of three. <laughs> the third prize, I mean, not out of three uh, pavilions, of course. But it's, uh, uh, it's significant to note that uh, the remaining two were also about water. And during the exhibition, we realized that Moskva River is something that cannot be seen as an object to be transformed. No, it's a subject that is alive, that has to be. Uh, an equal participant mm -hmm. in this process of interaction in the city. Let me briefly talk about how river used to be treated his his historically as a notion. In the ancient times, rivers were worshipped. They were part of mythology, they were deities. And a, a good example is a myth about Achilles in the Trojan War when he was killing lots and lots of enemies. He filled the river commander with so many bodies that the God of the river, the rage, the filled with rage, uh, the river of God, Xanthius was filled with rage, saying to Achilles that Achilles should not be doing this kind of thing. <laughs> and that was a period when any river was potable. The water in any, every river was potable. You could approach any river and drink water. It looks like paradise. Hard to imagine. Nevertheless, next period, when humanity gets certain notion about nature that is separated from human, and there is subject, and there is object, and uh, river is some kind of unknown phenomenon, that is now observed. And just humanity begins observing nature. That is a sort of pre-science, observing the nature. People create different kinds of schemes, including the calendar. This is calendar of uh, Russians based on natural phenomenon in the year. There are 14 seasons here, 14 seasons, and the beginning and end of every season is marked by a certain significant natural phenomenon. People start observing the river and people realize that there are some mechanical properties of the river that can be used, like this, for example, but that's the period when river still is the entity that is living and breathing. River still is an active participant of urban changes or just life in the city. There are floods. There are low water seasons, spring tides, and these kind of shows. And these kind of pop-up beaches were appearing alongside of the river. In many ways, thanks to the fact that river is a living entity that was constantly changing. In the beginning of the last century, maybe even earlier, nature stops being a phenomenon. It becomes a resource. Everybody starts grabbing as much resources as they can and sell them. There's this American historian, Jason Moore, who calls this period cheap nature. So planet for thousands and thousands of years has been preserving and building up oil, coal, etc., etc. And at a certain point, we start using all of that without having to pay anything to anyone. And water is one of those resources. Water resources. Water as a resource. In our case, that's the period of cheap nature, begins with Joseph Stalin. Stalin actively transformed nature of Russia. He began doing that. And the Moskva River also participated in that change. They built the channel that linked Moskva and the Volga rivers. 
the channel mm-hmm. named after Stala Moscow. Portum, Moscow became Marie. the Vidim. port city of five seas. Uh, As you see on this map, I'm sorry, it's not that clear. Can I point here? Nevertheless. What I mean to say, this white sea, black sea, Azov sea, Caspian sea and Baltic sea, those are the five seas uh, that Moscow was connected to. And that helped Moscow as a growing city to solve its water crisis. So much more water came into the city, flooded into the city, and everybody was more or less happy. In addition, you could finally navigate down the river. Even cargo navigation was possible so that construction materials could be delivered to the construction sites, which was very important for the growing cities. So Moscow water system became a tremendous uh, set of engineering, tremendous piece of engineering. So many people worked to design and build that. And there were such ambitious idea such ambitious ideas regarding how much water should have been flooding and fluxing into the Moskva River. Moskva River should even have had more water than Leningrad, than St. Petersburg. It's hard to imagine because St. Petersburg has sea, the sea. That was an ambitious project in Moscow, but nevertheless, we have what we have, including certain problems now here in uh, Moscow, and it's not that our... Grand, grand, grandchildren will have to solve this problem. No, our children will have to deal with that. It's the problem not of our offsprings and descendants, far descendants, but of our children. Now, Moskva River is not a river. It's, of course, a natural stream of water that floats down the body. There is the basin of the river, and that basin consists of Groundwater, um, underground water. Unfortunately, all of those parameters are not really happening in Moscow. Um, no, what, uh, Natural flow, for example, and body of the water. Body of the river. The fact is, Moscow is Moscow River is fully regulated. The basin has been increased by the factor of two and a five after the channels were built. The water is fed not really through groundwaters. In a way, yes, but 50 percent of that water is coming from the downstreams of uh, sewage water. So that's the way I illustrated that. That's all the water runoff from sewage, half of the water in Moscow River. Moscow River. So it's important to understand what the construction of the river. Give me, give you, let me give you a crash course in hydrology and geology. So the body of the river and the flow of the river, this is the way down which the water in the river flows. And that way is constantly changing. That is natural. But in Moscow, this way is this greenish thing. This is the way Moskva River used to float around. But after all of the dams and embankments were built and stone embankments and all kinds of um, gates, floodgates. Of course, now the flowing of the river is very much regulated. So the flow doesn't change at all at many stages of the flow. Compare, that would be natural and green. It's like you have the highway of four lanes and now you have one lane. So now Moskva River is a cascade of dams. It's kind of a set of baths, set of reservoirs. Uh, как бы, 
and of course uh, the bassin, water does not flow uh, through them uh, and that's that why these reservoirs become filled with spilt and ooze of course the river uh, is always a network of water and of course that network is within the landscape and the highest point of the landscape that is the border of where the border where water is being stored of course also underground soil water is also something that's feeding the river but that's not the case for Moskva River at least not, not entirely the case here's the basin of the Moskva River this is the new channel that was built and this is the upper basin of Volga River and due to the channel, as a result of the channel, it became actually the part of the basin of the Moskva River because there is so much water from Volga in the Moskva River. Of course, there is also the head of the river. And there is so many different chemicals in the water. We, we imagine we imagine rivers some kind of abstract body of water, and water is something abstract, some, some abstract substance, but there are so many chemical processes happening, and chemical reactions happening within the water. Some chemicals, some entities that were not entirely toxic become, for some reason, more toxic, and then, in a while, less toxic. That is a process that goes back and forth. That is the chemistry that is influenced by many factors, including oxygen, temperature, etc. We shall come back to all of this. I'm telling you this so that you would understand that water is not just H2O. There is much more matter within water than you might see. And mm. here's what the water in Moscow River consists of. So, in the head, Выпустили в нее все стоки, очищенные из курьяновских и люберецких очистных сооружений. So after вот all of the water comes in the river, half, просто как бы 50%. 50% of the water in the Moscow River comes from all kinds of dams and reservoirs. So now question why Moscow River is not naturally a river anymore. So, let me briefly tell you about how works the ecosystem of the river, if I may. I'm an architect, not a hydrologist. So, these are a few processes in the river. So, they are, there are some fungi, and there's some weed underwater. They consume oxygen. Also, river consumes that oxygen. Also, uh, fish eats that weed, and fish consumes that oxygen. And humans pour something into the water, into the river. And that something can be processed by the river, biodegraded by the river, if there is not too much of that something. But at a certain point, People just pour too much stuff into the water, and that stuff becomes accumulated within the water, within the body of the river, and that leads to the fact that river becomes contaminated. Of course, the river can clean itself at the top and at the bottom. So fish actually might consume all the kind of negative matter at the bottom of the river. But at a certain point, fish cannot consume that much of poisonous matter. So that leads to pollution. And that leads to some kind of immune deficit of the natural ecosystem of the river. The river, yes, can clean itself to a certain extent. river has a certain kind of immune system. That sounds odd, I understand. But you should understand that water of the river can clean itself, it's self-cleaning to a certain extent. It's the certain form of immunity of the river, and it might work or not work. And that way we can determine whether river is healthy or not. Let's look how healthy it used to be and what's happening to the river now. We see that in the 70s and 80s when there was so much production in Moscow, so there was so much more 
water runoff into the river. The river was dirty, then lots of production facilities shut down, and the river became, became so much cleaner. Now, there is so much more people living in Moscow. That's why water runoff into the Moscow River became so much more bigger. And as a result, there is much more nitrogen in the river, first of all. Now the river cannot clean itself. And now there is so much matter at the bottom of the river. And that leads to the fact that the water becomes ever more polluted. And Moscow River, of course, has a certain status, as any other river in Russia, a legal status. And that status also defines the degree at which water is clean in Moscow River. Strangely, Moscow River is split into two parts. Within the city of Moscow, it's one part, but outside of the city of Moscow, that's the different part. So, the border of the city defines the different part of Moskva River. It's hard to describe how that happened, but nevertheless. And within the city, it is allowed to pour not entirely clean water. Outside of the city, Water becomes something very, very important all of a sudden. They breed fish in there legally all of a sudden, and people can swim in the river all of a sudden. But within the city, it is not allowed to swim. So outside of the city, it is allowed to swim. By the way, the quality of water outside of the city is not any better than within the city, at least at the bottom down there, in the right part of the image. The second part is about all that matter at the bottom of the river. There were so many chemicals, so much different kind of matter that poured into the river. So now water pollutes itself. Water becomes muddy when it runs down the bottom of the river. There's, there are these deposits of matter, of chemicals, at the bottom. And the only way to clean the bottom of the river is actually to make the flow of the river stronger. Now we have so many dams on the river. And now that's why there is so much more ooze so much more ooze in the river. And uh, that's why the flow of the river is slow. That's the river that we have. That's been engineered. People figured out this, this system of washing through. That was happening every five and seven years. But for some years, but for some reason, about for the latest 20 years, that has not been happening. Uh, the river has not been washed through. Let me explain why that happened. There are so many different kinds of buildings alongside of the river, and they are so closed down the river that if you want to kind of do this washing through the river, all of these buildings, all of these mansions will be flooded, and of course nobody wants that. In addition, to the things that I said about the water and Moskva River, there's also this idea that all of the water is everybody's water. We know that human being consists, human being consists of 70 percent, 70% human being consists of water. But we know that about 60 percent of that water, 60 percent of the cells in our body are regenerated every six Days. As a result, within 16 days, most of the cells in our body will be built out of the water in Moskva River, meaning the water that we drink. For example, you drink water from Moskva River. Of course, you filtered it, etc., but nevertheless, your body becomes a body that consists 
Это интересно. Of the water of the Moskva River. That is curious because you can actually extrapolate this idea and imagine Moskva River distributing down the pipes and tubes, entering every apartment, every person, literally. This is the scheme. Similarly, Moskva River gets out of us, goes into some black box, which is called water cleaning facility, and you cannot swim there, and then it all goes back into the Moskva River. What happens next? Let's take a look at this. Moskva River flows, it actually flows into Kolomna. Oh, there is a mistake. So it runs into Kolomna. And the first irrigation intake happens at the city of Ryazan. So in the city of Ryazan, they kind of drink our water. Let me explain you what's this black box of um, a water cleaning facility. That's kind of an abstraction. If we take a look at what they clean those facilities, they clean out nitrogen, nitrates, nitrites. So it is assumed that water will clean itself somehow. By the way, clean facilities that are in the city of Kurianovsna, they, do, they don't clean out uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. The black box of this cleaning facility. In the valleys of large rivers, one biologist told me, I don't know whether I can believe that guy, but I believe he might be true, so I googled it, googled it up, and I realized that synthetic hormones, including female hormones, you know, that we're drinking all kinds of pills and antibiotics, those antibiotics and medical, all kinds of medicines, they never dilute, they're never diluted by the water. So they remain in the water the way we drank them, or the way they, these uh, medic medicines came out of us. So naturally, the population of fish in the river become more female due to these hormones that come out of us and get into uh, the water of the rivers. There are about 220 elements in the periodical table of Mendeleev. Do you have any idea how those elements influence one another? And water is a huge sponge that can um, absorb anything. There are some chemical reactions happening within the water. I'm not being paranoid here. I talked to people who research these things. Let us return back to the core of the lecture. So some kind of water, some kind of hormones, all of that stuff somehow goes into us, gets out of us, goes through the black box of cleaning facilities, goes back into the river, and then goes into us. And it, this is everybody's water. We're dri drinking this water. We are being washed by this water. And it is cleaned through that black um, box. And in many ways, this is the story about everybody's water. But this is, in a way, a political issue. There's this big river, the Rhine, in Germany. You probably know it. It connects many states in Europe, actually. It's a huge river flowing through entire Europe. The head of the, um, the head of the river is in Swiss Alps, then through Germany, then through Benelux. So more than about eight European countries actually host the basin of this river, and it's quite curious what happened to Rhine. It was more or less polluted. Of course, industrial era made an impact on the river. And these European countries began caring about the pollution of the river in the 50s. There was a commission in charge of cleaning the river. It was an international commission. And there was a certain period when this uh, committee was actually doing many useful things because in 1986 there was a huge chemical catastrophe that happened with the river and that organization invented the program entitled 
entitled Salmon 2000. So they wanted to return salmon into the river by the year 2000. They actually accomplished their goal three years earlier, so that commission also developed a program so that anybody could swim in any part of the Rhine River, so it, that was healthy to swim in the river again. So that international committee to clean Rhine became um, sort of a hallmark experience and became a platform for communication and discussion between European countries that further on built the EU. So everybody actually highlights that this experience of Rhine became one of the cornerstones that put EU together initially. And today, you can swim in the Rhine River. This is Basel, the city where chemical catastrophe happened. And now people can swim during lunchtime in the river. They have these uh, bags where they put all of their clothing and go to work across the river. They just balance on their bag and swim down to their office. Um, well, this story about Rhine teaches us a few interesting ideas. Turns out that we're not physically connected by the water. We all drink some kind of water. We're all connected to the water. And there's a source of that water. And then this water flows somewhere. And somebody's going to be drinking this water after you. And you're drinking water after somebody. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's everybody's water. There's this beautiful metaphor. Metaphor of this writer. I forgot his name. I'm sorry. So let me recall the name. I will find it. That's, yeah, here it is. Philip Farmer, the science fiction writer, he has this uh, series of books uh, titled River World. This is the series of books about this artificial planet, very similar to Earth, but all the entire surface of the planet was terraformed. Was terraformed. So that there's one river, only one river flowing through the entire surface of the planet. One river with one single source and one single mouth. So this is the situation where you always have to deal with um, your uh, neighbor up or down the river. And you always drink water and consume water after somebody else. So this is everybody's water. It cannot be your individual sewage. It's everybody's sewage. It's everybody's water. And this river world story is very inspiring. In a way, we think about Moskva River. We have to. We should come together around Moskva River. And we believe that this cleaning of the Moskva River actually can put us all together. And maybe one day we shall be swimming in the Moskva River again. Actually, swimming in the river is a cool marker, cool test. If you can swim in the river, that means that it's clean. There's no need to set different kinds of norms. This is just the Magna Carta in a way. If you can swim in the river, the river is clean. So if you uh, want to swim in the river, we must make it clean. Uh, During this Triennale in Milan, that exhibition about Moscow River in Milan, exponat, we had one particular uh, exhibit with Gena, the crocodile. This is the famous Soviet cartoon, very popular. So Gena, crocodile, goes into the river and he says, those bastards, they pollute the river. And he dives into the water and actually covers the pipe with his ass. And the factory explodes. 
while the и вода как бы становится чистой while the crocodile plugs the pipe and then the river becomes clean again and now it's the done deal that's brave uh, brave thing to do so we've been thinking that we can come together around the Moscow river and cleaning the river might be an idea that can put so many people together and who knows where we will go with this maybe one day all of you will be swimming in the river next time when I ask you whether you have been swimming in the Moscow River, you'll be able to raise your hand. Please visit our website and of course connect to our social movement and tie to friends of Moscow. It's not just coming together around the river. This is friendship with the river. When you treat the river as the equal counterpart, when you respect the river as a subject, by the way, in the New Zealand, a few rivers even got passport now. They have even now uh, right 